We now move to momentum oscillators, which in my opinion is the hardest part of this reading. Fortunately though, I don't think you are likely to be tested on the details related to momentum oscillators. So what I will do over the next few slides is highlight the most important and testable elements. If you want to study this in a little more detail, you can go through the curriculum and then if you want even more detail, then you can study this material in books related to technical analysis. But make sure you do that after your exam. I am going to actually simply read this slide because I have already listed the main points here. Momentum oscillators help determine whether the change in market sentiment is ordinary or out of the ordinary. Momentum oscillators are indicators based on market prices. They oscillate around a given value or between two values. Now just to connect this with the earlier slide, we talked about four different kinds of indicators. So we said that they are price based indicators and then we have oscillators or momentum oscillators. Momentum oscillators are also calculated based on price, but they are a little more sophisticated than the two basic price based indicators that we talked about earlier. And then later on, we'll talk about the two other types of indicators. But, but right now we are on momentum oscillators. You also need to recognize the concept of convergence and divergence. I will describe this briefly here and then we will see examples when we talk about the actual oscillators. Convergence means that a oscillator shows the same pattern as the price of the security. This suggests that the price trend will continue. Divergence means that the oscillator shows a different pattern from the price of the underlying security and this implies a change in the price trend. We will look at four types of oscillators and here again there is a lot of detail in the curriculum. I'll simply touch on the main points. The momentum or rate of change oscillator is calculated using this formula. So M stands for the indicator that you come up with. That is equal to 100 multiplied by V is the value or the closing price of the security minus Vx. Vx is the closing price of the security X days ago, which is typically 10 days. On the right, you see a picture of a security. So these are bar charts. And at the bottom, we have our ROC indicator. This is perhaps the most important statement over here. If the ROC crosses into positive territory during an uptrend, this is a buy signal. So notice over here we have a uptrend and during this uptrend, we have the ROC indicator, which is crossing from negative territory into positive territory. So this would be a buy signal. If the ROC oscillator crosses into negative territory during a downtrend, this is a sell signal. An alternate way to calculate the indicator is to use this formula. M is equal to 100 into V divided by the value of price X days ago. This causes the oscillator to oscillate around 100 instead of around zero. So in this particular case, it oscillates around zero. With this formula, it would oscillate around 100. The second momentum oscillator we'll talk about is the relative strength index. The relative strength index should not be confused with the charting method called relative strength analysis. This is where we had the price of stock A divided by the S&P 500. What we are talking about here is a little different. This is called the relative strength index. This is a momentum indicator. RSI is computed over a rolling time period and graphically compares a security's gains with its losses over the set period. Typically that set period is 14 days, but it could be different. Here is the formula. The relative strength index is equal to 100 minus 100 over 1 plus 
R S. So I will write this in a manner that makes this a little more clear. So 100 minus 100 divided by 1 plus R S. The R S stands for the sum of the up changes for the period divided by the sum of the down changes for the period. Let's say we have a 14 day period and in the 14 day period we have 10 days where the market or this particular stock went up and 4 where it went down. During these 10 days let's say that the market went up $2 every time that it went up. That's a big number but just for illustration. So overall the up move was 20 and let's say every time it went down it went down by $1. So the overall sum for the down changes would be equal to 4 because here the change is $1 every time it goes down. So RS then is 20 over 4 which is 5 and then the indicator becomes 100 minus 100 over 6 which is approximately 83. If you plug in different numbers you will notice that RSI is always between 0 and 100 but mostly it stays between 30 and 70. The example we used was a little extreme because we took a very high number in the numerator. So we came up with 83. You notice that what is happening here is the market is going up a lot. And that should suggest to you that when we have a relatively high number, then the market is probably overbought, which means that this is a good time for you to sell. And the approximation or rule of thumb is that if the RSI index is 70 or more, that means that the market is overbought. And if you look at the situation here where the stock is going up, we reach approximately 70. This is a overbought region, which means the logical thing to do is to sell. When the RSI index is small, 30 or lower, then we have this situation over here where the market is down. This would be a oversold point which means that it is sensible to buy. The third momentum oscillator we'll talk about is the stochastic oscillator. The stochastic oscillator is based on the observation that in uptrends prices tend to close at or near the high end of their range and in downtrends they tend to close near the low end. The stochastic oscillator oscillates between 0 and 100. The default setting is typically 14 days and as you see over here the stochastic oscillator has two lines. One is called percentage K, the other is called percentage D. You calculate percentage K by doing 100 into C. C is the most recent closing price minus L14, this is the low price over the recent 14 days, divided by the high over the recent 14 minus the low over the recent 14. And then per percentage D is like a long-term moving average. That is simply the average of the last three daily percent Ks. This is more complicated than the previous oscillator and I think the probability of being tested on the details of this formula are very remote. Just recognize the basic item given over here and here also we have a concept of oversold and overbought and that range is 20 to 80. The final momentum oscillator we'll talk about is the moving average convergence divergence oscillator. This is sometimes called the MACD and is constructed using two lines. The MACD line, which is the difference between two exponentially smoothed moving averages, generally 12 and 26 days, and the signal line, which is the exponentially smoothed average of the MACD line generally nine days. Now again I think this is quite complicated and the probability of being tested on this is low in my opinion. The oscillator oscillates around zero. There is no overbought or oversold range here 
but since we have two lines there is the concept of crossover so when you have these two lines and they cross over then that suggests a change in trend so you have a crossover here and we have a downtrend then moving towards a uptrend we need to know the concept of convergence and divergence convergence is when the oscillator shows the same pattern as prices this suggests that a price trend will continue with divergence the oscillator shows a different pattern from the price of the security this implies a change in the price trend moving now to sentiment indicators and again to connect with the four kinds of indicators that we talked about we talked about price based and then the four kinds of momentum oscillators which are also based on price and now we are up here with sentiment indicators sentiment indicators gauge investor activity for signs of increasing bullishness or bearishness so these are not based on prices the various sentiment indicators that you need to be aware of are shown over here the most basic is a opinion poll where you ask investors or those who are impacting the market about their sentiment and based on the polls you determine whether the sentiment is bullish or bearish next we have the put divided by the call ratio if you've not seen these items before put and call are essentially derivatives and you will see these later in the course generally people buy puts when they expect the market to go down they buy call options when they expect the stock to go up now if this ratio is very low then what that means is that people have bought a lot of call options so this denominator is high and the number of put options is small which means that the market is extremely bullish or the market is expecting the stocks to go up lots of people are expecting the stock to go up when you have a situation like this we are likely to have a overbought situation and it is quite possible that a correction is imminent and most investors or especially contrarian investors here would then take a opposite position which would mean that they would sell vix is another sentiment indicator this is based on the volatility of options which are written against stocks in the s&p 500 the high volatility suggests that investors fear a decline margin debt is the borrowing that investors can do from the brokerage firm to buy stock now if there is a very high amount of margin debt that means that people have or investors have borrowed money to buy stock and that could be a indicator that the market is overbought and a correction is likely short interest ratio is the number of shares that investors have sold short divided by the average daily volume investors sell short when they expect the price to go down so if the short interest is high relative to the average daily volume this means that investors are expecting prices to go down when this ratio is high that means investors expect a short term decline but when there is a high degree of short interest the shares have to be repurchased later and this is material that you will see when we discuss equity so that would imply that later on when shares are repurchased the prices will go up so this will give you a mixed signal you have to look at the situation more carefully to determine whether this particular ratio implies that prices will go up or down at this stage you simply need to know that short interest ratio means the short interest divided by average daily trading volume and finally we are talking about flow of fund indicators so in our four sets of indicators now we are on the final one 
Essentially, the flow of fund indicators look at fund flows to gauge potential supply and demand for equities. The indicators we need to understand are given right here. Arms index is perhaps the most testable one. This we will see on the next slide. The others include margin debt, mutual fund cash position, new equity issuance and secondary offering. We have spoken about margin debt briefly before, but just to illustrate it in a little more detail, margin loans increase the purchase of stocks. So a margin loan is where the investor borrows money from the brokerage firm and uses that money to buy stocks. A declining margin balance may force the selling of stocks. When an investor borrows money from the brokerage firm, essentially he is going in negative territory. So from an investor perspective, since he is borrowing, he owes money. Now the more he borrows, the margin balance goes down. And eventually to pay off the loan, the investor will have to sell stocks. The way you can look at this is, if the investor is likely to sell stocks in the future, that means the prices are likely to come down. Mutual fund cash position. When the cash position is low, fund managers have bought and the effects of purchases are reflected in security prices. Just to make sure you understand this, mutual fund is one where lots of investors put in their money and then the mutual fund uses this money to buy securities. If you have an equity-based mutual fund, they will use this collection of money or pool money to buy stocks. A mutual fund typically will not put 100% of the money into stocks. It will keep some money in the form of cash or cash equivalents. If the mutual fund manager is very bullish on stocks, then the cash balance is going to be low. If the mutual fund manager is bearish, then the cash balance is going to be relatively high. So as a technical analyst, we can look at the cash balance associated with mutual funds in order to gauge the sentiment of the mutual fund managers. We can also recognize the fact as given here that if the cash position is very low, that means that all the money or almost all the money has been used to buy stocks. So the stock price will reflect the fact that all the money has flowed in and stock prices will be relatively high. New equity issuance. This refers to some sort of a IPO where let's say you have a company that has recently issued shares. What this does is increases the supply of shares available to investors could be viewed as a bearish factor because if you have a given demand and the supply is increased because of the IPO, then the price will come down. Secondary offering is fairly similar. This is where a company that has already issued shares before issues shares again. So the supply demand dynamics are fairly similar. Next, we will talk about the arms index. The arms index is also called the TRIN for short term trading index. It applies to a broad market such as the S&P 500 to measure the relative extent to which money is moving into or out of rising and declining stocks. The index is a ratio of two ratios. You need to learn this number of advancing issues divided by number of declining issues divided by volume of advancing issues divided by volume of declining issues and to help you understand this formula i want you to do this example calculate the arms index and evaluate the market mood you have a situation where we have a total of 700 stocks or issues the advancing issues in our example equals 500, declining issues is 200. So over here, the numerator would be 500 divided by 200, which is equal to 2.5. And the denominator is the volume of advancing issues divided by volume of declining issues. In our particular case, that is 4 million divided by 1 million. So 
our ratio of ratios is equal to 2.5 over 4, which is 0 0.625. Is this a bullish or a bearish sign? And here is what you need to learn. If the index that you calculate is 1, that means the market is in balance. And you can see that if the advancing issues equals declining issues, then your numerator would be 1. And if the volume advancing is the same as volume declining, then your denominator is 1. And clearly, in, in the situation that I just described, you would have a market which is in balance. If you have an index less than 1, which is what we calculated here, that means there is more money in rising stocks. And you saw that here. Advancing issues 500, volume is also very high. Clearly, there is more money going in advancing issues relative to declining issues. So the market is in a buying mode. If your index turns out to be greater than 1, that means more money is going into declining stocks. So the market is in a selling mode. The answer to our question here then, given that we have a value of 0.625, is that the market is in a buying mode. Moving now to cycles. Technicians use various cycles to predict future movements in security prices. Even cycles in fields such as astronomy and climate can influence the economy and hence capital markets. The way you can think of this is, that the climate will impact, say, agriculture. Agriculture will impact the economy, which in turn will impact capital markets. The cycles that you need to be on top of are given right here. There is a little more detail in the curriculum, but I think the material on this slide should be good enough in terms of covering what you get on the exam. You have something called the Conratif or K wave. This essentially says that Western economies have a 54 year cycle. Then there is an 18 year cycle where we have three 18 year cycles which make up the 54 year cycle. Generally, this is used in real estate prices but also found in equities and other markets. You have something called a decennial pattern. This pattern connects average stock market returns with the last digit of the year and it has been seen generally that years ending in zero, for example 1990, have shown a poor performance relative to say years ending in five, such as say 1985 or 1975. These have shown good performance. And finally, the US presidential cycle. This suggests that the third year following an election shows the best performance because this is the time where the president is trying to boost the economy so as to have a better chance of being re-elected. The Elliott Wave Theory. This is another area where you will find a lot more detail in the curriculum, but from an exam perspective, I think knowing the basic information here should be sufficient. This is named after the gentleman who came up with the theory. So what Mr. Elliot determined was that markets move in regular repeated waves or cycles, and he came up with a pattern of five waves as shown below. So wave one up, two down, three up, four down, five up, and then a reversal. So wave A, B, C. Market waves follow patterns that are ratios of numbers in the Fibonacci sequence. And with the Fibonacci sequence, you have 0, 1, 1. And then every number is the sum of the previous two numbers. So 3 would be the sum of 2 and 1. 5 is the sum of 3 and 2. The reason this is useful is that we can use ratios such as 1 over 2, 2 over 3, 3 over 5, 5 over 8 to predict the size of subsequent waves. And obviously it is a correct prediction of subsequent waves that is going to be useful for a technical analyst. The final part of this reading is intermarket analysis. Intermarket analysis is based on the principle that all markets are interrelated and influence each other. 
we need to look for a inflection point in one market as a warning sign for a change in another and perhaps the most important point is that we use relative strength analysis for different groups of securities to make asset allocation decisions now to connect this with what we saw earlier when we talked about relative strength analysis of stock a we talked about the price of stock a divided by the s&p 500 where a is a stock that might be in the S&P 500. So we were looking at the performance of A relative to the index which contains A. With intermarket analysis, we actually look across different markets. So we might take stocks and represent stocks by a given stock market index. And we plot a graph that shows the stock market index divided by, say, a bond market index. If this graph is going up, that would imply that the stock market is doing well relative to the bond market. If this starts coming down, then our analysis tells us that the stock market is not doing well relative to the bond market. So we can use inflection points such as this to make asset allocation decisions between stocks and bonds. We can use a similar analysis to consider the allocation of various sectors in an economy. So this could be done for the pharma sector versus the energy sector. It can also be done for securities from different countries. So you can have the US index divided by the Indian index and do a similar analysis which will help you decide what percentage of your portfolio to have here versus here. I have covered this material at a high level but again I will emphasize you, you don't need to get too hung up with the details as long as you know the main points chances are that you will be able to deal with the question that you get on your exam. Let us summarize the main points. You need to understand the principles and assumptions. So technical analysis is based on the idea that we look at stock prices and volume data and use that information to try and predict what will happen. And we do so by using charts, trends, chart patterns and technical indicators. Now here with charts, we talked about your simple line chart, bar chart, candlestick chart so those are perhaps the most important charts then we talked about the fact that we can have a uptrend which is essentially where the trend line connects the lows we can have a downtrend we have the concept of uh, support and resistance so this would be your resistance line this is support then we might have a change in polarity where your old resistance might become the new support. We talked about chart patterns where we have continuation patterns or reversal patterns. The most important reversal pattern is the head and shoulders pattern. Then we talked about four kinds of technical indicators that you need to be on top of. We have price based and then momentum oscillators which are also based on price but are a little more sophisticated then we talked about sentiment based indicators and flow of funds based indicators we talked about various cycles such as the 18 year cycle the presidential cycle and so on the Elliott wave theory was a brief one slider and you need to be on top of the material that we covered there. You need to know the basics of the Fibonacci series and the ratios that I showed you on the slide and then intermarket analysis which we just covered. As always go over the learning objectives, do the examples in the curriculum. They are not that many but the few that are there are good. Now extremely important that you do the practice problems in the curriculum unlike the other quant readings where the questions are quite difficult the technical analysis questions in the curriculum are exam type so you will notice that all of them are multiple choice and they are a very good indication of what you might see on the actual exam you will also note that those questions do not get into too much detail so 
they are again a good indication of what you will get do them several times and then as i keep saying try to practice from other sources also that just helps you retain this material in a better way that is it